Good afternoon, and thanks everybody for joining us today. As of 2 p.m. today, there have been 7,562 positive cases of COVID-19, including 329 deaths. Over 81,000 Missourians have been tested at this time. In, in the last week or so, there's been lots of questions of, uh, about the utilities, about rent, about eviction. And today I'm going to try to cover over some of the things that's in the CARES Act, some of the things we're doing in the states to clarify some of that. I know you, there's been several questions of that. So let me just kind of start with the uh, CARES Act to kind of say kind of what we're doing on that, uh, what Missouri's portion of that is. But under the federal case CARES Act, Missouri will be receiving funding to help support additional housing resources and assistance, such as community development block grants. Existing emergency regulations allow for grant payments to providers for items and services such as food, clothing, housing, or utilities on the behalf of an individual or family. With this funding, 15 of Missouri's largest cities and counties, including the St. Louis and Kansas City metro regions, will receive over 24 million dollars in additional assistance. Another area the CARES Act funding will support is the Emergency Solution Grant. Missouri will receive approximately $9.4 million. These funds can specifically be used to help unsheltered homeless, sheltered homeless, and those at risk of homelessness. The funds can also be used for eviction prevention assistance, including rapid rehousing, housing counseling, and rental deposit assistance. And we anticipate federal guidance on these funds in the next few weeks. In addition to these grants, several ways Missourians can receive housing-related assistance. Under the CARES Act, a moratorium on foreclosures for all federal-backed mortgages, including those covered by HUD, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Federal Housing Administration, the Department of Veterans Affairs, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, was put in place for 60 days starting March the 18th. On top of this, a borrower experiencing a financial hardship due to COVID-19 may request an extension for up to 180 days. Additionally, $900 million under the CARES Act was set aside for supplemental funding to help low-income families through the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. This program specifically assists families in paying their utility bills. Now, at the state level, our administration worked with the investor-owned utility companies throughout Missouri to stop disconnects and shutoffs related to COVID-19, ensuring that Missourians would not have disruptive, disruptions in utility services in the face of an economic hardship. Further, under the direction of my administration, the Missouri Housing Development Corporation is working on guidance that will provide additional $9 million in rent assistance to individuals and families that have experienced an economic setback from COVID-19. And finally, on April the 1st, the Missouri Supreme Court and several judicial circuits announced that they would suspend or postpone proceedings that included eviction or foreclosure cases until May the 15th. Also, in addition to concerns and questions that have been coming up, we've also continued to get questions regarding schools, both K-12 through and higher education. And today, Commissioner Van Dieven and Commissioner Mulligan are here to give us an update. So first, I would like to ask Commissioner Van Dieven for an update on DESE. Margie. Thank you, Governor Parson. Good afternoon. As we think purposefully about reopening the state of Missouri, we at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education are learning 
how our team members transition to providing services while working remotely and also looking ahead at what's to come in the next several months. You may be accustomed to hearing our department talk about K-12 education, and many are not aware that the agency also houses vocational rehabilitation and disability determination offices that provide critical services to so many Missourians. Over the last eight weeks, our vocational rehabilitation team members have served well over 14,000 individuals with disabilities each day on average while working remotely. That's nearly 100% of their normal workload, and our disability determinations colleagues working remotely have processed over 13,000 cases in these last eight weeks, and that's about 90% of the cases typically processed. The leaders and staff members in these programs have remained committed to providing uninterrupted services to their clients throughout this time of uncertainty. And now back to K-12 education. As I've shared each time that I've been at the podium over the last several weeks, I continue to be impressed by our school leaders, educators, and staff members for continuing to serve Missouri students, even though school buildings remain closed through the academic school year. We will see schools begin to wrap up a remote learning in the coming weeks as school calendar end dates vary from district to district. Until then, Schools are continuing to provide services to students, including remote learning and much needed meals. We're proud to say that more than 1.3 million meals have been served by our schools across our great state during these extended school closures. Now both Governor Parson and the State Board of Education recognize and reiterate the importance of celebrating our class of 2020. We have urged school leaders to think about creative ways to honor Missouri's graduating seniors and to celebrate their accomplishments, but in a way that protects public health and abides by social distancing protocols. This will look different for each district as graduating class size across Missouri's range from two students to nearly 2,000 students. We hope our seniors know how truly proud we are of them as they each take the next step into their future. Also, many people are wondering about what summer school will look like. Districts and charters are working to find the best solution they can for their students, families, and staff members. To help with that, our department issued guidance on summer school um, to our leaders last week. This guidance was informed by task force recommendations that emphasized scheduling flexibility to help accommodate these unique times, as well as establishing expectations for both remote and face-to-face -face summer learning opportunities. While summer school remains optional uh, for most of our students, this may be a time that more families consider this opportunity for learning, given the extended building closures. Last but certainly not least, DESE is preparing to distribute millions of dollars from the CARES Act to our local schools in the coming weeks. Missouri schools will receive $117 million from the USDA to reimburse schools for meals served during these extended closures. Today, DESE team members are submitting the final necessary information to the U.S. Department of Education to receive the $208 million that Missouri is getting for the Elementary and Secondary Education School Emergency Relief Fund. Our agency is doing all that we can to prepare for the incoming funds so that we can get those much needed dollars out to schools as quickly as possible. These funds will allow school leaders to address remote teaching and learning challenges and other important educational needs resulting from COVID-19. And finally, we look forward to working with the governor's office and the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development in implementing the governor's emergency education relief fund. Once again, thank you to the many school leaders, educators, and school support st staff members, as well as our parents, grandparents, and guardians at home who have worked tirelessly to ensure that our children continue to take part in educational opportunities during this time of uncertainty and for continuing to do so in the coming weeks. Thank you.
Thank, thank you, Margie. And uh, let me just say this for, for Desi and for the teachers out there, the administrators, uh, to go what we've go, gone through and to be prepared and do what they've done in some of the most unusual circumstances is pretty amazing. It's just another one of those reasons why Missouri's work ethic showcases every time we get into situations like that. So I, wa I want to thank the education, everybody involved in the education, to keep going what they've been able to educate those kids and being prepared. And also on a personal note, uh, as a grandparent, uh, I've got a granddaughter that's graduating in 2020, so I'm kind of rooting for those graduation dates to make sure they get an opportunity to get those diplomas in there. And I think sometimes she thinks I can do miracles, but uh, again, I'll be working with Desi and the administration to see what we can do for those high school seniors on that. The other one uh, that's here today, Commissioner Mulligan's here today, that will give us an update on higher education and workforce development, which will be crucial to the opening phases uh, of our state and the future in the months to come. So, Commissioner Mulligan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I want to talk about five uh, major priorities that the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development has focused on and will continue to focus on as we um, continue to move through this unusual set of circumstances. Um, our first and most immediate priority has been about immediate needs, so immediate workforce needs, immediate supply needs. Our colleges and universities have played a vital role in helping the state secure the PPE it needs to keep healthcare and other workers safe. Uh, our, health, our colleges and universities have also been engaged in conversations about other ways to help in the crisis, sheltering the sick, uh, providing housing for healthcare workers who can't go home. So the immediate response has been very, very uh, full-hearted and, and has reflected a great deal of passion for service on the part of our colleges and universities. At the state level, we also have been really focused on making sure we have the workforce we need to respond to the unique uh, needs that the current situation presents. And that would include examples like working with the University of Missouri and its extension and healthcare services to provide training to temporary uh, healthcare workers who have worked in the alternate care sites around the state. Uh, we will also be helping recruit the workers needed for contact tracing as that becomes a more real part of every day of our lives. And so we're really grateful for the opportunity to meet these immediate needs. Other immediate needs that our colleges and universities have met uh, has been supported by the CARES Act that the governor spoke about a little bit and Commissioner Van Dieven provided more information about. Our colleges and universities, both two and four year, public and private, have received funds that they've been able to use to help students directly. Half of the money that those institutions used had to be used for student help directly. And also to respond to other kinds of needs on campus as a result of COVID-19. And so that would include everything from setting up laptop libraries that students can can use uh, when they don't have access at home to buying hotspots to doing professional development around online education. So our colleges and universities have been very hard at work to make sure that their students' spring semesters can continue in a new format but with instruction uninterrupted. We're also focusing on the future of the Department of Higher Education, so transitioning from the immediate crisis to thinking about what comes next. Uh, we know that economic recovery is gonna be a topic at the front of everyone's minds, and we're lo looking forward to contributing to that conversation. Uh, our priorities in this area are making sure that Missourians have an opportunity to skill up and get the help they need to get back to work, that students will get the support they need, not just in this spring semester, but over the summer, the fall, and beyond. And we also want to make sure that the public workforce system emerges from this crisis stronger, more resilient, and more accessible than it was at the beginning. And the same true for the higher education system. This is an opportunity to really rethink the way we do our business, and we're excited about this conversation. Last but not least, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the last of our goals really focuses on making sure that as a department we emerge from this stronger, more, more cohesive, and better prepared for the next major disruption. Uh, I think like a lot of communities around the state, we have learned a lot about each other as we have shifted to remote work, but the thing that's been most clear most consistently is the passion with which the people who work for our department serve the citizens of the state of Missouri. They've been absolutely unrelenting, and I am grateful for the service they have provided. So please stay tuned. We're going to have a lot more to talk about in this space as the months progress, and thank you for being here today. Zora, thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, as we go through this recovery process, that's going to be one of the, let me just say, I think they're all busy right now, my directors and commissioners, but uh, we're going to be relying on that to get people back in the workforce, to get them back in those training programs are going to be critical to our moving our economy forward. So Zora, thank you and thank you for what you, all your team's doing over there. 
Let me also, uh, Director Lindley Myers is also here today, give us an update on the Department of Commerce and Insurance. Director? Thank you, Governor Parson. The Department of Commerce and Insurance provides regulatory oversight for the insurance, financial, and public utilities operating in Missouri, as well as the licensing of thousands of professionals who serve consumers. During the COVID-19 health crisis, we've been working closely with others in state government to remove regulatory barriers to allow for as, as many individuals to work in Missouri as are needed to help address the health and welfare of our citizens. We've waived a historic 114 statutes or regulations for 41 regulatory boards and our professional regulation division alone. We have filed or are in, the, are in the process of filing five emergency rules related to COVID-19. These waivers have allowed us to broad, broaden the scope and the number of healthcare workers who can provide services in Missouri. These waivers also allowed licensees to continue to operate by extending renewal deadlines or by temporarily waiving or relaxing some of the education requirements related to licensing or the renewal of a license. The department issued a bulletin that enabled us to temporarily offer resident insurance li producer licenses for various lines of insurance to assist those for work in the in industry, but also who was unable to complete the testing requirements while the testing centers have remained closed due to the state stay at home and social distancing orders. These temporary licensees must be sponsored by a licensed Missouri insurance producer, ensuring that their work is being reviewed and consumers are adequately protected. This temporary license allows individuals to start working, and to date, we have over 80 of these temporary licenses issued in Missouri. The Public Service Commission has also issued a multiple number of orders approving various utility requests related to COVID-19. These requests include waiver of tariff late fees, suspension of disconnections for non-payment, and waiver of reconnection fees. I'd like to thank Missouri investor-owned utilities that proactively requested the PSC uh, to approve and waive the commission's rules and company um, tariffs in order to offer relief to their customers during this pandemic. All of the major utilities, which includes electricity, gas, and water utilities in Missouri, requested approval to suspend disconnection for non-payment and to waive late payment fees and charges, helping Missourians to stay safely in their homes during this stay-at-home order. One of, the pri one of our primary responsibilities in the Department of Commerce and Insurance is to ensure the solvency and stability of the industries we regulate. This includes insurance companies and state chartered financial institutions operating within Missouri. Overall, the insurance market will weather the storm. These companies regularly prepare and run scenarios for the worst as they plan to, for severe economic conditions. At this point, we've not had any reports of insurance company uh, insolvency or liquidation. However, we continue to closely monitor the impact of COVID-19 for the current impact and future developments which may indicate actions needed to be taken on our part to protect our Missouri policyholders. We have regular discussions with our insurers and fellow regulators nationally and share information with each uh, in a real-time basis. I've issued several bulletins during this time asking our insurance carriers operating within Missouri to waive cost sharing for COVID-19 related testing, office visits, urgent care visits, and emergency room visits. We have also encouraged the robust use of telehealth services in order to render care while maintaining social distancing. I would also like to commend the insurance carriers who proactively stepped up to provide various forms of relief to their policyholders at a time when they needed it most. Our financial institutions have all remained open in some capacity through the COVID-19 crisis to serve the needs of Missourians. 
Although most closed their lobbies in order to comply with social distances protocols, they continued to provide services through drive-through banking or by scheduled appointment. Our banks and credit unions are solid with historically strong capital and loan loss reserves and are well positioned to work with their customers, both, co co both consumer and commercial, in dealing with the effects of this crisis. I want to thank our financial institutions for their continuity of service throughout this time. The department works closely with both our state and federal partners to ensure that we continue to provide the greatest amount of latitude in helping Missouri consumers work through the many financial challenges they are now facing. I want to remind everyone that we're here to assist you by answering any questions or directing you to the appropriate resources should you have problems. You can always find information about our through our consumer hotlines or more on our website at dci.mo.gov. And finally, I want to commend the exceptional service provided by our DCI staff and applaud their, their robust efforts during this pandemic. Thank you so much. Laura, thank you very much. Thank you for what your department's doing. And uh, as you was talking through the regulatory part of this, I think uh, as of today, we've uh, probably waived uh, probably over 450 statutes, regulations, policy uh, that we've done. And I think one thing we're learning from that also, we hope the legislators pick that up in the time to come and maybe really think about maybe making sure a lot of those maybe are don't go back on the books. I know my directors get nervous when I say that, but the reality of it is we got a lot of regula regulations out there that's really sometimes uh, hampers business. So with that, uh, let me just finish up here. With May the 4th, just a few days away, I want to remind Missourians how important it will be to continue social distancing throughout the reopening process. We must continue to prioritize the health and safety of our families, friends, and fellow Missourians. So remember, use common sense, and most importantly, follow the social distancing guidelines. We can do this, and we will, and we will succeed. Thank you, and God bless. Kelly, let's open it up for questions. Also, Dr. Randalls is here today. Uh, Director Carson's also here today on any updates you want might from them. So, Kelly? Okay. Well, let's start with Commissioner Van Dieven. All right. Hi, Commissioner Van Dieven. A lot of school, I know you said that school, you encourage school districts across the state to do different things to maintain social distancing. There are a number of school districts who are talking about doing in person graduations. Do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, I, I think um, that's, that's really why I included the point that, that our class sizes look vastly different across the state. If you have a class, graduating class with two students, it might be very appropriate to be able to do that um, in person. 2,000 makes that quite challenging. And so, uh, districts are exploring lots of different opportunities, uh, but the, the point for us is to make sure that we are recognizing those, uh, that class of 2020. Some are talking about extending it into a later time into the year, and I think any, anything that we can do to support our school leaders in those decisions will be really important. Hi, can you just uh, clarify the money part that you talked about? You said $117 million is coming for meals, and then 208 is that separate? That is. The 117 is coming from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, so USDA for um, school foods. And then the 208 million is coming through the CARES Act, and that's specifically to the elementary and secondary uh, school relief fund. And, and what will that pay for? So 90% of those funds will be distributed through the Title I process um, to our school districts, our LEAs and charter schools. Uh, directly. And um, I, I want to make this note, which might not mean a lot to, uh, to some, but it certainly means a lot to our school leaders. They are distributed through title formulas, but they are not title dollars, which means they have a, t a tremendous amount of flexibility. They're intended to, uh, to really assist during this time of crisis for COVID-19. Well, 
What, what do you imagine it'll be spent on? I think one of the big things that we're seeing right now, to be very clear, is this digital divide. Very concerned about the fact that uh, the inequities that we're seeing for our students are exasperated during this time of separation. And so we need to make sure that our all students across the state have uh, opportunity for, for success and have ac access to those resources. So that's one. Um, there's a few others, you know, a lot of different supplies, different travel routes, um, you know, um, Training for teachers, that, that's a big thing that we're hearing too. This is a very different way of doing business for our teachers and so making sure they're fully equipped um, to be able to deliver in this mode. There's been some conversation about schools possibly trying to start earlier in August mm -hmm. despite the, the school start law. Um, one, is that a serious possibility? And two, it may be um, something for the governor to address, but is the state possibly going to offer more per pupil funding for extended school years since students have missed essentially an entire quarter of school? So I will say um, that that school start date is certainly something that we're looking carefully um, at right now. And how it's written in legislation is that the State Board of Education does have the authority to waive that in extenuating circumstances. Some of you may recall the board denied request for that in March. Um, they may revisit that in the May 12th meeting, so I'll be able to tell you more about that May the 12th. Um, at, at this point, I think it's pretty clear we will not be seeing any additional funding um, for, for schools um, for the extended school year, although that might be an allowable cost through uh, some of those care funds that are being distributed. Hi, Commissioner. Um, Hi. You mentioned the inequalities of um, education are kind of highlighted during this time. Mm -hmm. um, some school districts going completely online, some not able to doing fully packet learning. Um, is there, moving forward, is there anything that um, you are taking from this um, for the future just as um, guidance to um, expand maybe broadband or um, educational opportunities for those yeah. rural. Absolutely, and I, and I want to say I, I really think we're going to see some, some big shifts in the way education is provided throughout our state, throughout our nation. I want to be clear, that doesn't mean going solely to online. I think one of the th things that we have seen from our children, from our teachers, that absolute need to be with one another, the relationships, the components, but there are a lot of things that we can do outside of the classroom, and we'll learn, um, we're learning a tremendous amount through this, and I think our key priority is to, again, ensure that every child in this state has access to that high quality opportun uh, educational opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the department will be helping with uh, recruiting for contact tracing. Did you mean is that department workers that will be doing that tracing or will you be recruiting outside people to do that? Sure, we'll be recruiting outside. Uh, one of the things that's happened in this situation is a lot of people are working in things that are adjacent to their day job, but they're helping in ways that may be new. So we certainly will be working closely with the colleges and university schools of social work uh, and other kinds of professions that are closely related to contact tracing to recruit uh, people to work in that occupation. And we'll also be working with other partners throughout state government. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if this is for you or maybe the governor to answer. I, I, forgive me for not knowing exactly the jurisdiction on this. But because the Defense uh, Production Act was evoked um, to keep these meatpacking plants open, are these folks available for any kind of workers' comp or special protections on the federal level if they get sick? I'll pass that on to the okay. governor. Okay, well, I do have one for him. Well, go ahead. We re we're ready? All right. Now the question was on the uh, workers' comp, on, on the people in the uh, meat processing? Yes. Is, it, is that what it was? Yes, they if they get sick. Um, or ill, are they allowed any special protections under the Federal Government Production Act or because of evo evoking that act? You know, I, I don't, I don't, th I'm not, I don't know. Uh, I would have to really look that and s see what uh, the guidance of that is. But I, my guess would you be treated like any other employee any other time. Basically, that's just saying the, those businesses have got to stay open. We've got to keep the food chains moving is, is what that guidance was. But I don't know the exact guidelines uh, of that. But I would assume it would fall under any thing that you're on the workforce that you may have is whether it's an injury or whatever it might be. 
So that could um, still possibly qualify as normal workers' comp. Yeah, I would think so. Whatever call would do that. But again, you're, you're talking about the coronavirus that's been here for 50 days that we know of, much like other symptoms. So I, I'm not sure what the federal guidelines are of that. I just have to look and see. Okay. All right. Okay. Governor, as May 4th is soon approaching and businesses will be opening, is there any guidance the state is providing for workers who don't feel safe returning to work or don't feel comfortable? Well, I, I think the one thing is, you know, when we open the state up, if they got to go back to work, if their boss calls you and the business owners calls you, go back to work, you got to go back to work. If you don't feel safe about going to work, you always have the individual right to stay home as an individual, just like you would in today, uh, whether you decide to go to work. But uh, look, these businesses are going to go back up and the employees that are going to go there are going to have to go back to work. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that uh, as we move forward, I think that's going to be a gradual uh, the way we open up business. But no employees, if your boss calls you and tells you, you got to go back to work, you got to go back to work. Um, you, when you mentioned the CARES Act funding uh, regarding the rent and evictions, any idea when the state will be receiving that money, if we, or maybe we've already received some of it, or when the cities can expect to receive those you know, dollars? I, I, we're working on all that right now. We, we've got a team of people working on it. My staff's working on that, and there's probably an answer for that, but I don't know right now as I stand in front of you. But I know there's still guidance coming in every day on how to spend this money and uh, money coming in all the time. So, uh, again, I just want to stress to you, we're really on the clock when that money comes in for whatever program it goes to. And if we got that in the guidelines, we're trying to get it out the door as soon as we can. And then I think all the websites we got set up, all the different uh, entities that handle it are pretty well on a daily basis where you would know as a media. I, th I think uh, it was yesterday the day before, I think it was Kurt reported with, with the post that how the counties were going to be distributed the money there. And I think once that meeting was over, that was posted immediately. So all of that we're trying to put out there just as soon as we can. But uh, uh, that's what I know of it as of now. Governor, uh, some people in the St. Louis area heard you talk about surge testing uh, at the meatpacking facility and wonder if in the St. Louis area there have been enough positive cases that surge testing is something that, that should be happening there. Yeah, you know what, and I might have Dr. Williams follow up on this one, but we, we've been well aware of that the whole time. We, we put up the, a lot of mobile testing to St. Louis. We put more testing up there in that region. I think, too, the other thing when we say mobile testing, I think now it's to the point, too, that we can take testing to people that maybe don't have the ability to go to some of the test sites that we have around the state. And I think there's like 125 of those test sites now. But we also have the ability now to take that mobile to those areas where they don't have, maybe where they wouldn't have transportation to go. So I think all along we, we've been working with St. Louis region up there, making sure they got the supplies. And anytime they've called, as far as I know, Dr. Williams has showed up there, him and his team, to do that. But, but let me let Dr. Williams just address that a little bit. And if you have some other question for Dr. Williams, Thank you very much for the question, and the answer is yes. Uh, so, uh, as you may know, we are doing that uh, this week around Missouri. We're doing 4,000 tests in eight locations. We're in the third ward of Kansas City this week. We're getting our first results back from Sunday, and uh, that. St. Louis, I talked to Spring, and you may know uh, Schmidt, who's head of the St. Louis County Health Department. They have put out an RFP to do 5,000 tests. Uh, to look at St. Louis County. There was some talk about the hospitals coming together and doing that for St. Louis City, but they wanted to do it regionally, and of course St. Louis County money has to be spent in St. Louis County. So I uh, texted yesterday with the mayor, uh, Mayor Cruson, and we very much are looking at going in as we have these other places now that we know the hospitals aren't going to do it and doing that surge testing in uh, St. Louis City in areas in which we think uh, we haven't as much robust testing in areas of which we've uh, established vulnerability. But to the governor's point, uh, we have opened up, it's either six or eight um, uh, mobile testing sites, or, or we haven't, but we partnered. You know, to me, public health is at its best when we're a force multiplier, a military term, but we take our efforts and use it to multiply others. So we're incredibly appreciative to Fred in St. Louis City, to Spring and Emily in St. Louis County, to our FQHCs, Affinia and others. Uh, we've opened up a mobile testing site today uh, where we go out and using Affinia as nurses, we test people who can't get into our mobile testing sites. So that's a long answer to your question, but the short answer is yes. We, will, we, we feel like St. Louis County is covered by Spring and her 5,000 test. 
just like we were in Kansas City, uh, we are going to go into St. Louis City and do that as well. Um, Dr. Williams, with the boxing strategy for containing outbreaks in the future, given the delay between infection and when people start sh showing symptoms, mm -hmm. how do you address that portion of it? Uh, how much time do you have once cases are identified to actually contain it? Well, I'm going to use an example. We just sent out a press release at 2.30. Some of you may not have seen it, but I, I suspect if you'd seen it, you'd want to ask questions. So in Buchanan County right now, it's St. Joseph's. So we had our first case identified there two weeks ago tomorrow. And we were in there on Sunday night, I think it was, on Monday. And so we have done uh, uh, 2,405 tests and are doing more today. We got our first tranche back from Monday today. So of 707 asymptomatic people, 92 were positive. Those are people who had identified as not having fevers, not having symptoms. We're expecting another 917 to come back today. They'll come back overnight. And we've got another 414 coming back tomorrow. So uh, we are sending up today for these asymptomatic people, to, to your question, uh, we are sending up a team of contact tracers to work with uh, uh, the uh, local health department in St. Joe's. And we will immediately box in and go in because these people are all asymptomatic. Uh, we've had a, a total now of 132 employees at uh, Triumph test positive. Some of those were symptomatic, but the vast majority are asymptomatic. So in this case, we were on this within two days. We've identified 92 asymptomatic people already, and that gives us a tremendous power to go in and do contact tracing and isolate that. I cannot thank enough the employees uh, for what they do. As the governor said, uh, they are vital to our food chain. So we thank them for what they're doing, and we thank them incredibly for letting us test them. Uh, I think the, the testing rate, like I said, we've already done 2,430, I think, and there are only 2,800 employees. So we're incredibly appreciative to them to give us the information to help them. Can't say enough about Mosaic and Northwest and, and our elected officials up there. I've been in conversations with the mayor and the presiding county commissioner today. But going forward, uh, we now have the testing capacity to move in very quickly. Uh, to a site of three, we had 3,000 tests within 12 hours of needing them in uh, Buchanan County. And, and that is a testament to the providers up there and our capacity. Yeah, Would you recommend that that meat plant be shut down? I do not. Uh, again, uh, we uh, are working with the CDC. We're working with our colleagues in Iowa. Iowa is really the thought leader in this. Uh, I'm on conversations with them frequently. We have a call into the CDC. At this point, you've got to remember uh, the vast majority of these people are asymptomatic. We expect more to come back. Uh, if you look at our trend line, we think there will be more in the 917 tests that come back today and the 404, I think it is, tomorrow. But at this point, we will do what we do in public health, which is epidemiologically contact tracing, isolating, quarantining, and uh, uh, identifying those. And so, uh, again, cannot thank them enough. We think what they do is incredibly important. So all of us uh, uh, are able to go to the grocery store and get food. But, but clearly, our, our number one uh, goal always is to protect the health and safety, and that's why we're in there doing 3,000 tests on asymptomatic people. Uh, Dr. Williams, oh, excuse me. Uh, based on what you just answered, and also that the doors of businesses are reopening mm -hmm. Monday, are you at the state level or our local health departments going to inspect these plants, inspect restaurants? Uh, throughout the reopening process for they're following the very rules that you laid out uh, in a document just a few days ago? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So uh, we have a comprehensive testing strategy that we've put together uh, at the governor's request going forward now that we've moved out of the acute phase and the recovery phase. And so one thing we're looking at, uh, again, our local health departments always inspect restaurants for the things you're talking about, but I think what you're really talking about is COVID-19, if I'm not mistaken, right? So as we look at our vulnerable populations, uh, long-term care facilities, meat packing plants, certain areas, one thing we're very much in the process of doing is to look at what sentinel testing would look like and surveillance testing where you would just go in periodically 
uh, similar to what kind of Iowa was doing with meatpacking plants, and just do type of preventative testing and looking at exactly what you're saying. So that's very much on our mind. We're looking at best practices across the country. And I would say that if you ask me that a month from now, we probably will, in fact, have implemented that. I'm actually asking about adherence. If, a, if you laid out rules for what restaurants should do, mm -hmm. spacing, protection, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. adherence, even on the, the role of the meatpacking plants, because we're obviously workers are reporting that they're not keeping distance, that they are having interaction, that they are exposed. Well, th that gets back to the point that, you know, they're like being a doctor, when I examine a patient, I have to be within one foot. So I can't be spaced in that situation. And we've made allowances for that so that you wear personal protective equipment, you pay attention to symptoms, you use hand sanitizer. So there will be businesses uh, in which you cannot stay six feet apart. Uh, that's just uh, the way it is. But as you know, part of our uh, order on Monday, we recognize that and make sure that uh, if you're going to be within that six feet, that you follow those other safety measures. But how do you ensure that they will? Well, again, I think, like so many things, people report violations when we regulate a lot of industries. And then for our local health departments, uh, they will go in and do their normal inspections. And in our normal regulatory world, so much of uh, what we do is based on people reporting people when they don't do what they do, and then we investigate. In a small town, I make press on this, but on a small town where businesses and everyone are, you know, know each other, uh -huh. do you expect people to report? And, and those tests, those inspections, I understand, are annual. Mm -hmm. They might be biannual or annual. Right, right. But I'm not talking about when there's a, like you right. said, a major health issue. You know that there's one. Yeah. How can you ensure that they're going to follow your rules? Well, I think, as the governor has said, uh, I think it's in the best interest of businesses to practice safe practices. Uh, I think for the vast majority of Missourians, they're not going to want to frequent or go to a place in which they think uh, their safety is being put at risk. And, I, and as the governor said, COVID-19 will not disappear on Monday. So that uh, if I was running a business, and I know the governor's been a small business owner, I would want to make, and I was, I guess, for a long time with my own practice, I would want to make sure that when patients came into my waiting room, there weren't 30 patients in a waiting room designed for 10, because I think they would say, wait a minute, this isn't safe. So uh, much of this is based on uh, businesses uh, doing the right thing for the people who come to their businesses. But thank you. Um, Governor, do you currently have any plan to get PPE to uh, more people than just first responders and healthcare providers, but state workers, for example, especially uh, prisons, uh, psychiatric hospitals, those kinds of settings? Well, I think the directors have to evaluate each one of their departments, but, but I think as we move forward, I think we all realize that PPE in different situations, people are going to want to wear it. Uh, so I think the, the market will bear that, and I think a lot of the businesses in the state of Missouri that have now geared up to make PPE or the face shields or the different items they're making. I think that'll go to the private sector. Uh, I, I can see that market, market picking up for a while. Uh, especially, you know, and I don't know which area, you could, you could use the meat processing probably for one, that they should be able to use some sort of protection. You may see the salons, uh, places like that where pretty close quarters that you may see that. But again, I, I think that's gonna be driven by the private sector. But uh, as we move forward, PPE gear is becoming more and more available. Now, we're still fighting that battle every day to get more and more in because we want to build up our stockpiles. But the first thing, I think your first response in your hospitals are getting that under control now to a certain degree where they have a certain amount of cushion of days that they have. And then I think we're just going to build from that to where the private sector will go. But again, that's going to be private business. And I think that's going to be driven by, by the business owners, the employees, and the customers. Are there places in the state budget that would allow, for example, the Department of Corrections to purchase N95 masks for employees? Or yeah, look, look, I, you know, I don't know what all it, what money's in the state budget other than I know there's 30 some odd billion dollars in there, but I do know this: if we need to do anything to protect our employees in the state, we're going to protect our employees in the state. And if it's a matter of supply and PPE, and we think that's the direction to go, we'll, we'll make sure and provide that at the state level. Let, let me make a comment on. Uh, a while ago, it was talking about testing again, and, and I just 
want to stress this point when Dr. Williams was up here. You know, Monday we're going to open up the state, uh, all across this state to open up the businesses. All the testing procedures we're doing today, I, I want to make sure everybody's sure we're going to continue to do that, only we're going to be doing it on a larger scale as we ramp that up for that whole 30-day process. So when the question came up earlier about St. Louis, all of that we're going to track uh, just because we're open up on money doesn't change anything to do with our model that we're using for the state of Missouri with the dashboards we're using. We're still going to collect that information every day so we really can get a good view of what's going on wherever you are at in the state of Missouri and know how to deal with that if we do have those hot spots. So. There's been some confusion from residents who live in the Metro East regarding their, they live in Illinois and they work in Missouri. When Missouri opens up which order should they listen to, the stay-at-home order in Illinois that was extended, or should they be coming to work? Yeah, they, they should be coming to work. I, I, I'm not sure what the Illinois uh, order is, but uh, I would assume maybe they don't have any non-essential business or maybe they're not working at all in that state. But if you got a job and you're in Missouri, and again, the, your owner calls you and says you, gotta come, you need to come back to work, you need to come back to work. All right, thanks, all right, thanks everybody again. Thank you.